praise you, Lord. And today we're going to continue our tour through the book of Galatians. This is part six. And we're going to start in Galatians chapter two, verse 11. The section we're going to go through is highlighted by a dispute between Rabbi Shaul and Simon Peter, Kepha. So it says in verse 11, chapter 2, verse 11, But when Peter, Kepha, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Peter, Kepha, his name is Aramaic, Kepha, which means little or small stone. And where does it say he went to? This is uh, Rabbi Shaul. He says he went to Antioch. Interesting that we would be talking about this, uh, teaching on this during the time and season of Hanukkah. I didn't plan it this way, but it just happens to be right here. Where, where else have we just talked about someone who was associated with Antioch? Going once, going twice. The story of Hanukkah. We just talked about Antiochus Epiphanes the third and the fourth. Both of these men ruled over the Greek Empire, in particular, in particular the area of Syria and Antioch and its surroundings. So he goes into the stronghold of Satan where Antiochus ruled years before. But you know there's areas of the world, you know the scripture talks about the prince of Persia. There are demons and principalities in certain areas, and they basically rule there until they're dethroned, is what it amounts to. So he's in this area, Antioch, in Syria, where he's dealing with these same spirits and same people who are descendants of those who lived there, potentially, during the time of Antiochus Epiphanes. So he goes into the stronghold of Satan and to begin to reach the people there, and to set up messianic communities still under the umbrella of the Jewish leadership from Jerusalem. So look what's happening. There's a dispute amongst them. The leadership, and not just any leadership, but the top leadership of the whole movement. How many of you know, sadly, that disputes arise even amongst the called and chosen of Messiah and I believe that there should be some back and forth between leadership in order for Adonai's work to be done. There's a long-standing Jewish tradition of rabbis discussing doctrine, sometimes coming from totally different positions, often disagreeing, etc. And it reminded me of something, a story of rabbis. I taught a few weeks ago about the two houses of thought in Judaism, the house of Shammai, and the house of Hillel, both influential rabbis of the land in their time. Again, Rabbi Hillel was known for being more lenient and understanding and patient, whereas Rabbi Shammai was more dogmatic, legalistic, and rigid. For a time, Rabbi Hillel was a student of Rabbi Shammai un until he died. And I want to read a famous story regarding this taken from, the, from Tractate Shabbat 31a. It says, Once there was a Gentile who, became, or who came before Shammai and said to him, Convert me on the condition that you teach me the whole Torah while I stand on one foot. Shammai pushed him aside with his measuring stick he was holding in his hand. The same fellow came before Hillel, and Hillel converted him, saying, that which is despicable to you, do not do to your fellow. This is the whole Torah. And the rest is commentary. Go and learn it. So he gave him a simple answer of what Torah is. Gave him a simple answer of how to get along with people, your brothers and sisters. How to get along within the community. How to get along within the synagogue. How everything should be. Amen? So we know that what to do and what to teach, the rest is just commentary. 
on that. Love, Messiah said, love your neighbor. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Messiah quoted Vehafta. Same idea, same principle, nothing new, just restated a, a different way. So the knowledge and the cultural history and the social norms of the Jewish society helps us to know what was going on, what was expected. These two rabbis knew each other, they knew each other well. They were both pulling the rope in the same direction, albeit they had two different um, assignments. Rabbi Shaul was sent to the Gentiles, whereas Kepha, he was sent to the Jews. However, both of them were still sent to congregations that were being led or under the umbrella of Messianic Jews. How do I know that? For one, we see here, they're the leadership, and they're the ones who are over these congregations going out and teaching. So we see that continue. Verse 12 says, For before certain people came from Yaakov, he regularly ate with the Gentiles. This is what their, the argument is about, or the dispute is about, or the problem. But when they came, he began to withdraw and separate himself, fearing those from the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, so that even Barnabas, Barnabas, was carried away with their hypocrisy. So there's a long-standing Jewish norm and tradition and teaching of the Jews not associating with the Gentiles. Was it because that Gentiles were just bad or just a particular negative? No. But to a Jew, to be with a Gentile was a problem because the Gentiles, without Messiah, they were unclean. So you couldn't be in contact with a Gentile then go to the temple without ritual cleansing again. This is part of why they were supposed to stay apart. But something happened when Messiah came. Messiah died. That wall of division was broken down. But this is what they're dealing with right here. But they're dealing with it right after this happened. They're dealing with it right when these changes were taking place. These new things, new problems that they never even thought about, never had to deal with, were presenting themselves to them. And here it is, they're the leadership. Everyone is looking to them, so if they don't get it right and do it right, guess what everyone else is going to do? They're going to do the same, the, whatever it is, either right or wrong, they're going to do. So again, the long-standing Jewish norm of not associating with Gentiles, not being seen with them. When Gentiles wanted to convert to Judaism, the Jews would make it hard to do, sometimes virtually impossible for them to do so, especially those of the mindset and of the house of Shammai. Here we go again, these two different ideas, two different competing viewpoints. They were impatient and legalistic. And so that brings up a big issue. These Messianic Jewish rabbis had a difficult, or they had difficult decisions they had to make. They had to make them on the fly. There was no Torah for them to go back to on some of these things. They had replaced the Sanhedrin and the rabbis who didn't know uh, Messiah, and prior to Messiah who were writing the um, Halakhic laws. They were the new, basically the new Sanhedrin, the Jerusalem Council, or the formation of it. So on one hand, they were still Jews who had accepted Messiah. On the other hand, they were now tasked to not only go and talk to Gentiles, but to bring them into Messianic Judaism and to bring them into the newly formed Messianic synagogues and congregations. A lot to do. Thousands of years of history and how to go about doing things in a lot of regards, didn't matter anymore. They had changed. They had been tweaked. They had slightly changed direction, not by the will of man, but by the ordinances of Adonai himself. So they were being careful not to be seen consorting with Gentiles by the circumcision, by the Jews, by those who taught 
that the Gentiles need to be circumcised to receive salvation. Those who didn't understand that the Gentiles received salvation through Messiah. And because of that, if they want to be circumcised or not, okay, fine. But they weren't called to be uh, keepers of that covenant. Now, back when that covenant was given, way back when there were Jews along with uh, you know, the um, covenant of Abraham with circumcision, if you became Jewish then and converted, well, guess what? You were circumcised then. So they were still looking at this. There's, again, these two houses and two different viewpoints that have come together. So I've got a question for you. If you have to listen to people, or you have to listen to what the Lord told you to do, who are you going to listen to? Because at this point, that was the problem. The Lord told them to go and do something that prior to their generation was not a not kosher to do. It violated many things. I've been on the internet, um, part of these different messianic groups, and there's always someone who brings up some very insignificant, particular question. And they make a big old deal of it. You look at the, the feed on it, everyone's going back and forth and all this. And I don't like chiming in on those kind of things, but I did one time. Because the leader, this, he's, well, I don't want to say where he is because he could be watching. Out of the country somewhere. And it's okay, the discussion. But the way it was brought up was it, it created more division and confusion than really answers. And the question he brought up was, well, you know, was Yochanan the Immerser, John the Baptist, did he break kashrut by wearing the coat made of camel skin because camels are unclean. Well, he wasn't eating the camel, but he was wearing the camel. But he was touching the camel. And so there's a whole lot of back and forth. And I, I just kind of, I went to pull my hair out. <laughs> there was none left to do so. That's what happened, exactly. Questions like that. And so I chimed in a little bit and went back and forth. And before long, now the guy occasionally, he'll post something. Hey, you know, what do you think of, you know, or bring me up in an old post. Um, but they were dealing with real issues. Not some made up, we have nothing to do, let's create some controversy to discuss. Real issues, life and death. And they had to decide, are they going to listen to Adonai and be found pleasing to him? Or are they going to listen to men? Are you going to listen to Adonai, the one who has called you and ordained you for a task? Or are you going to listen to men who you may love and respect, but they're getting in the way of you fulfilling the call of Adonai in your life? This goes for us too. This doesn't just go for them, although they were, at, they were the tip of the spear dealing with these things. So we love, honor, and respect men. They loved, honored, and respected their brothers whether they had received Messiah yet or not. And in a lot of cases, not only did they not receive Messiah, but they branded them as heretics. They lost inheritance. They lost birthright. They lost everything that for thousands of years of the history of the Jews had been an ex expected and accepted way of doing things. They lost all standing. Just like that. And not only did they lose standing, but now they're called to be the beginning or really to really shift gears into this new movement and be the ones who are leading it. You know, the leaders are the first ones. When you go to war, the leaders are the first ones that the bullets come at. And people are hiding behind them or running off, not supporting what they're doing. So here it is. Now you have two leaders. And if they're not on the same page, you're going to have a problem. I love how the Lord puts these things in there where you see the humanity and reality of being human and living together, of working with people, of all of those things. I love sitting down and watching. I watched a debate 
between a Messianic rabbi and a, um, an Orthodox rabbi. And the Messianic rabbi is very good and very skilled at what he does and how he does it. And how he pulls things out, how he doesn't push him too far. And he got a lot of good points across. And they both did. But at the end of the day, the Orthodox rabbi had respect for him. And we pray that he receives Messiah. He was presented with a, an outstanding case of why Messiah, Yeshua, is Lord. But that's normal. That's, normal. that's just how they do it. You say, no, you think this? Okay, well, I don't think this because of this. That's okay. We're still brothers. We still love each other. But this, now they're not in Jerusalem. They're way out. He's gone all the way from Jerusalem. He's in Syria now and meeting up with them there to discuss these things. Who knows how long this had been festering and, and being an issue. And again, they just walked into this issue. They didn't do anything wrong. They just found them, themselves in a place where it's like, wait a minute. If I go over here with the Gentiles like the Lord is telling me to do, I'm going to catch all kinds of grief from over here. And if I don't and tell the Lord no, how's that going to work out? Sadly, in life, we're, all, we're often presented with these type of choices and we can't remain on the fence like the rabbis here were doing, albeit temporarily. The scripture says, And Joshua, choose this day whom you will serve, Adonai, or the gods of the Philistines. But I'd say, choose this day whom you will serve, Adonai or man. Who will you serve? Who will we serve? In this context, we see them not want to offend their peers, not want to have conflict with their peers. However, the same issue arises up in life when dealing with children or subordinates. Are we going to listen to those who are under our authority and follow their wishes or listen to Adonai and follow his wishes, which often runs directly counter to those under us? These issues have been going on since the beginning. Adonai doesn't share everything he has called you to do with everyone else, especially to those who are under you. And it's everyone's business to mind to their business and to be careful to stay out of the business of those who are over them and to prayerfully support those who, over, who are over them. The kingdom of heaven is not like an earthly kingdom where the king rules by force, though. The kingdom of heaven is a kingdom of what? Volunteers. It's a wonderful thing. Love always allows people to volunteer. Hate, the opposite, would control people. We can all choose. And it's a great thing. We all voluntary, voluntarily serve at a night. He doesn't force us. We voluntarily submit to the authorities he has placed over us. And that's the safest place to be where Adonai calls you to be is a place of protection. So here it is. You have these rabbis and they're trying to set these exact things up. Places of protection to those who received Adonai who want to come together safely, securely, and have a congregation together. Just what's being set up. Because they can no longer go to the synagogue. They can't worship Messiah in a synagogue somewhere. In a regular synagogue, they have to go with a Messianic community. This group of rabbis has been placed in a leadership position, but they are scared of retribu retribution from family and friends, so they try and sit on the fence. Jumping from one side to the other whenever it's convenient. And when this happens, and when it happened, everyone was hurt. Rabbi Shaul, he gets wind of this, and he goes a long way to go deal with it. When we as individuals are not doing what Adonai calls us to do, it hurts everyone. It hurts everyone around. When Adonai warns people about things and they continue to rebel and are then disciplined, others around can feel it. It doesn't just affect the individual. It has a ripple effect through the whole community or a whole family or a whole office. I mean, you fill in the blank. When peace rules, things are wonderful. When great peace rules, when a little unroll comes, 
you feel that you know. When peace was ruling heaven, things were peaceful and great. But there came a day where there was a great rebellion. Things were no longer great. Things had to be dealt with, and the Lord dealt with that. Sadly, we're still dealing with that, that spirit that is still around. And we get to choose whether or not we, we embrace the spirit of Adonai or the spirit, the spirit of the anti-Messiah spirit. You know, people talk about the anti-Christ, the anti-Mashiach. But Scripture says there, there are many, and there have been many, anti-Messiahs. It's a spirit. It talks about the spirit of, it's a spirit. And it'll come and it'll try and get on you and cause you to go the wrong direction. And all this, and you know it. You know when you ever been mad about something and you want to, instead of being angry, but do not sin, you want to be angry and sin and just. <laughs> and you say, no, I mean, that's not right. You know, you got to decide. Be angry, fine. You want to be angry about something that's wrong? Sin not. And if you sin and you blew it, well, then, okay, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done it. I'll be trying to be better next time. I'm still human too. Amen? Hallelujah. So this name, we talked about Barnabas. He was one of them in this group that we're talking about. And I want to go over his name really quick before we move on. His name comes from two words, bar Naba. Bar is Aramaic, meaning son. It's like Ben in Hebrew, means son. And the Hebrew word Naba has two different spellings. In Hebrew, it can be spelled with an Aleph or with an Ein. And I wish we had a little thing I could put it on the board. They both have similar meanings and come from the same origin of the same word. The word Naba means to prophesy, to speak or sing by inspiration or prediction of something or simple discussion, prophesying, or to make oneself a prophet. It's also believed that it may have been from the uh, name son of Nebo or Nabu, me, which was a pagan god. But despite that, this name was relatively common during this time in Israel. But it's interesting because people have this idea that a prophet is someone who stands in a spiritual office, who's directed by Adonai to bring words to the people, and uses words like, thus saith the Lord, which is accurate, but incomplete. I didn't, I didn't think that was going to be funny. So when you look at it, you can interpret his name as son of a prophet, prophet's son. We remember the sons of the prophets back in the time of Elijah. And they had the opportunity to do good or to do evil. In this case, he did good. So, um, But that being said, we see his life was definitely used by Adonai during this time, directing, teaching, and perhaps prophesying to the early congregations he went to from city to city, teaching and encouraging these new congregations. His name has also been translated as son of encouragement which again, prophesying or speaking the word of the Lord is an encouragement. We know there are prophets today based on Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. That being said, many, prophesy, many people prophesy without even knowing they're doing it. They may be praying about a situation that's troublesome. And the Lord may tell you not to worry about it, but to trust him. Then you, when you talk to someone about it and they say, how is that situation going? What's going on with that? And you say to them, I was praying about it and Adonai gave me his peace about it. I have given it to him and know he has taken care of it. You're prophesying over the situation with your words. When you read the Bible and speak the scriptures over your situations, you're prophesying. When you speak healing scriptures over your body, you're prophesying. And I say that because a lot of times people get this idea and they pigeonhole a word or an idea. Um, and in Hebrew, so many things, they're so much bigger than the typical um, uh, t 
typical understanding that's taught. Um, and a lot of times it's taught in a typical legalistic way that that's it. You know, nothing else to see here. That's it. But in Hebrew, there's always something else to see. Amen? So I encourage you to prophesy over yourselves and over situations and Adonai as he leads you. You know, we're called to be the priests of our own home. Well, Messiah walked in all the gifts. We have the Holy Spirit in us. We can walk in all the gifts to a certain degree over ourselves and over what we're responsible for, over what we're the covering over. Hallelujah. You know, we have authority over that which the Lord has entrusted us with. And we just we need to remember more and more. Amen? Hallelujah. You know, when you have a congregation of believers that's strong, when you're weak, you have strength you can draw from others. When there's a congregation of people who are weak, there's no one, there's no help. And it's sad. We all know people. I have friends and family that I wish I could say, hey, you know what, go to this congregation because it's a strong congregation. You'll find help there. Sadly, Messianic congregations are, I mean, we're few and far between. Um, and so for me personally, we've come out of congregations that were very strong in exercise, exercising the gifts of the Spirit and very strong in trusting the Lord and believing the Lord. You know, we talked last week, two weeks ago, about um, uh, what situation was it? Someone was questioning the Lord. After he had done miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle for him and his family and his forefathers. You know, we have to be at a place where we come up to a place of, um, of, uh, of need that we're strong and ready, you know. When we're here worshiping every week, that's the time to worship the Lord, to get closer to the Lord. Because when we're out during the week, you're going to want to be back here worshiping the Lord, being together when you're dealing with the things that we have to deal with. So I encourage you to prophesy over yourselves and over situations in Adonai as he leads you. Amen. So here we have Yaakov picking up again in verse 14. But when I saw that they were not walking in line with the truth of the good news, I said to Peter to Kepha in front of everyone, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? I love this here. I love this. I wish this was read in every Christian church tomorrow all over the world. You know, a lot of things that are taught when we first became messianic, a lot of the things, they challenged everything and anything that we ever thought or believed from Scripture. And I had someone call me one day, just a friend, come out of the Christian such a church and everything, and, and they were messianic. And they asked, I don't remember what they asked me. They asked me something, I just gave a simple answer. But it had been so long since I had come to know that truth that I didn't think anything of it anymore. But they just kind of went, <laughs> and they were choking on it. And I looked and said, well, what, you know? And their words were, you know, what you just said, we know it's true. You showed us biblically. But it challenges everything we've been taught for 30 years. Everything we believed. And I said, well, I get it. I know, it challenged me too. I'm over it now, thank God. But this is one of those verses here. Traditional teaching says that we're supposed to get rid of Jewish things. Go back to King James. Get rid of all the Jewish names and customs in Scripture. Changing all the names to Greek names. Or many of them. Getting rid, we're supposed to get rid of the teaching of the Old Testament. That's not for today. We're to call ourselves Christians and put away with all that Jewish stuff. Anybody ever heard that kind of thing? God forbid. The rabbis were tasked to bring the Gentiles into Israel through Messiah Yeshua. 
The Christian church is taught just the opposite. The church believes their task is to bring the Jews and other Gentiles into the church, have the Jews remove their talitot, their talits, their kippot, their kippas, and break the instructions given to them by Adonai, which he commanded them to do, not till Messiah comes back the first time, forever. Forever. Forever is a, a mighty long time. It hasn't ended yet. So who are you going to listen to, Adonai or man? Hallelujah. Are you going to do what's popular with man or with Adonai? I know the answer for everyone here, but it's still challenging. It's still very challenging. Because every time we come up against a new truth and a new light, guess what we're expected to do? Walk in it. Walk in the truth and that light. When the psalmist David, I believe he wrote it, um, the path of the righteous grows brighter and brighter until the fullness of day. It only grows brighter if you continue to walk in it. You know, the Lord won't reveal anything new to you if you reject the things that he's taught you. Hallelujah. I like coming here and teach every week because you guys don't get to see my face when I'm studying saying, yeah, but Lord, what about this? Well, no. Okay, all right. You're right. Didn't see that before. Let me. Now I'm excited about it. People ask me about things. I just say, you know what? I told you that 10 years ago. Well, let's talk about it today. I told you that five years ago, five months ago, five weeks ago, five days ago, five minutes ago, five seconds ago. You know what? If the Lord tells you something new and it doesn't, you had an understanding about something, God bless you. You had an understanding about something and then he tells you something new and it's totally opposite and you have a better revelation about it. What should you do with your understanding? I mentioned this story before, and I'm almost done. There was a gentleman who, um, very prophetic, or in, uh, not prophetic speaking, but into prophecy, I should say, did this big conference and everything. And someone who was probably 20, 25 years older, very well known in Christianity um, for decoding prophecies and that kind of thing, he was there. And he was scheduled, the man known for the prophecies was scheduled to come up after the man who was doing this conference and presenting what the Lord had shown him. Says the man was leaving the stage. Here comes the well-respected person who's much older, has been around a lot longer. He comes up. On the platform is a stack of his new books. Because it's his time to come up and sell, sell his new books to the people. And he walks up there. He goes up to the mic and he greets the people. And he tells them, I wrote this book. And I thought it was good and thought the Lord was talking to me. And he did. However, I don't want you to buy my book. I want you to buy this man's book that he wrote. Because what the Lord has shown him. He's answered questions that I've had that I can never answer in this book that I've been talking to the Lord about for 20, 25 years. And he walked off the stage and let the other guy come up and he kept on going in. It doesn't matter how long you've been around or how long, um, how long you've been around, how long you've been serving the Lord. What matters is revelation of the Lord. That's, that's what changes you. What, is, what has the Lord revealed to your heart to to teach you personally, to teach someone else, to help someone else in a family. And then the Lord shows you something. I'm looking at you. I'm not going to say any names. And maybe you're the first one in your family. He's shown that. We were there. We were there. We are there. We're still there. And then you say, well, you know, I could go back and just back to the happy days with not knowing this and just continue and be miserable, which we, me, and the Lord. 
or I can embrace it and just know, you know, Lord, I know with this comes persecution and misunderstanding, accusation, all this stuff. You start feeling like a caretaker of the Messianic movement amongst your family and friends. And everything that comes up, they look at you and expect you to, you, you, excuse me, you on the third row there, look for, you know everything about this, right? You better not be wrong. Oh, you mispronounced that little word, so surely everything you've ever said is wrong. And there you are. You hear the one little light up there. Shabbat shalom, shabbat shalom, shabbat shalom, shabbat shalom, shabbat shalom. Hey, it's just you. But the Lord always does that. He always will raise someone up in a family, in a community, a Yehuda Maccabee. I love the song on the Meshuggah Nutcracker that talks about those hero like Judah Maccabee. They hold their hand they hold their high for all to see. Every time I hear that, I want to start crying. Because I know what came against him from his own family and his own people. And the Hellenistic Jews who want to be just like the Greeks. No, let, just, let's go ahead. And, but no, he had held his hammer high. After his father had died, he had to take the mantle to continue. Who are we handing over the mantle to when we're done or helping? So I appreciate you all. And the last thing I have to say, or actually read one more thing before that. To repeat myself, are you going to do what's popular with man or Adonai? Or are you going to humble yourselves under the mighty hand of Adonai, casting all your cares on him? Trusting him a day at a time. Trusting him a situation at a time. Or not. Hallelujah. Father, we worship you. We praise you. We thank you for the word that has gone forth. And we thank you, Father, that we know when your word goes forth, Lord, it goes and it accomplishes that. For that thing that it's been sent to accomplish, it accomplishes it, O oh God. We thank you for all of our brothers and sisters who are here, those who couldn't be here today, who are watching or who will watch. We thank you for those who watch from all over the world, O oh God. I especially thank you for those in Haaretz, Israel, the land of Israel, O oh God. I thank you, Father, for everything that you're doing in their lives, Lord. Israel's going through a lot of pain, oh God. And I pray that anybody who's there is listening, that you would turn to Messiah, Yeshua, you would accept him. You would be part of the light in Israel, the light of Messiah that needs to be there. And I thank you as we continue, oh God, we continue to talk to people and minister to people, oh God. And there's coming a day that the last person that you've ordained to be saved and receive you is going to, O oh God. So we ask you to help us, Lord, to hasten that day, O oh God, to do the work you've called us to do, that the work you've called us to do will be completed. There will be no strings untied, O oh God. Help us to do what you called us to do in every other Messianic congregation, O oh God, and every, every other church, O oh God, that's been called to bring people into you, into a saving knowledge of Yeshua, HaMashiach, Messiah. So we thank you and praise you for that in the mighty name of the Prince of Peace, Yeshua. Amen and amen. Next week we'll pick up in Galatians chapter 2, verse 15. Hallelujah.